Welcome back to the channel everybody. So we got a lot of big stuff going on today. We have some some Ripple XRP related news. Uh, we have some gold news. We have some insane bank news again. I don't know what's wrong with the banks. They're snapping. We have some Bitcoin news. Of course, history is, is happening. Apparently, did Congress finally do something? <laughs> did, did they do something besides collect a check? I don't know. Maybe something happened. We'll cover that. <laughs> we'll cover that as well. I hope you're all doing fantastic out there. And hopefully YouTube will let me upload the video today on time. What was that? <laughs> all right. Anyway, it's a good day today, folks. I hope you had a fantastic day. So we're going to begin right here. This article is titled Ripple Files Trademark for, for RLUSD Stablecoin instead of USDR or USDX. But they can't use USDX. That's what the what was that company just there was some company just released a coin. I believe it's called USDX on Flare. No, uh, no, not on Flare. Wait, wait. I mean, Flare and Songbird is the same thing, really. Um, but they released it on Songbird. I believe that's what just happened. Correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Um, so they can't use USDX, but really the name doesn't matter as long as it serves its function, you know. And, you know, institutions are all crazy about stable coins. Yes, they're gonna, they want to make money with regular crypto. You know they're going to go all in with the top cryptos. It's just a matter of time. They're already doing it with Bitcoin. And, you know, we'll see if the SEC is trying to kneecap Ethereum or not. And I guess we're going to find that out soon. But, you know, it's inevitable. But they also want stable coins. They want that that balance there. You know, something familiar with them. They need a security blanket to hold on to as they wade into the waters of crypto. You know what I mean? So as long as it serves its purpose is what, what matters as far as I'm concerned. You just see that? My, did my light just my light bulb just go? What was that? Oh, and I look right at it, too. Now. I looked right at it when I turned it on. I was expecting it to be out. I don't know what that was. It's like the light popped, but it's not blown. I've never seen that before. Paranormal? Somebody out there like, paranormal, Mick. So, now, anyway, this article here is titled, Ripple has filed trademark for RLUSD stablecoin, suggesting that the likely listing symbol for its proposed dollar-based stablecoin says the application for the RL USD uh, trademark was lodged with Justia, a U.S. legal database on May 7th. Although Ripple has not made a formal announcement, crypto community members speculate that this move is related to the stablecoin it intends to introduce in 2024. Meanwhile, the trademark application confirms the speculation that RL USD is likely the ticker symbol for Ripple's forthcoming stablecoin. It outlines RLUSD's use in electronic financial services, specifically for monetary transactions involving receiving and distributing payments in virtual currency. All right, we're going to leave that one there because we have a lot of articles to get through. So let's jump to this next one. we got a lot of big things happening today. So now this article here is titled. If it'll pop up, I don't want to read it from the, the, the UR, what they call it, the HTML. I almost said URL. That's battle rap. What am I doing? Ripple versus SEC impact. Torres decision and XRP Army's role in the FIT21 crypto bill. All right. Let's find out what's going on. It says on May 22nd, the House of Representatives voted on the financial innovation and technology for the 21st Century Act. Marking the first step towards a regulatory framework for digital assets. Oh my, it's been years and years and years. Finally, something's happening. Key influences on this landmark bipartisan crypto bill include the Ripple versus SEC. SEC. Every time I... Come on, Ripple. Smack them down. Let's get, get this over with. It's almost time. Judge Torres's summary judgment. The Honorable Judge Torres, yeah. And the support from the XRP community, shout out to the XRP community, including lawyers, pro XRP lawyer John Deaton's crypto law highlights these contributions in the preparation for Fit 21. To be quite honest, I just want all of this to be over with. I want clarity for crypto. And then people will see the absolute un, uh, 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 unfettered domination that crypto is. Fit 21 crypto bill passes. It says U.S. House 
uh, the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act, H.R. 4763, will provide regulatory clarity over the regulation of digital assets and protect consumers, becoming the most important crypto bill to date. The they go into political stuff here. I don't know why. Does it make a difference? Which uh, who's doing it? Like, are, are, are the parties still that? Like, you know what? I was going to say, are the parties really still that separate? But you know what? I don't even want to discuss that kind of thing on the channel. That's not up. That's not up our alley. U.S. House ranking member Maxine Waters. And I really don't care for politicians. I really, really don't. Just this is my humble opinion. U.S. House ranking member Maxine Waters says the bill is not not fit for purpose and create can create massive loopholes. Huh? Now, now that the bill is out. And it's trying to provide this clarity. It, isn't it now like sort of up to the courts and such like that to provide like certain clarity on the definitions within the uh, the legalese? I'm not sure how that works. You guys, you guys, let me know. Crypto law uh, founded by Deaton Law Firm said Ripple versus SEC lawsuit Judge Torres decision in the case and XRP Army's relentless pressure to seek clarity have helped in addressing the creation of a bill. So, hey, listen, everyone, you made history. The fight you fought the good fight. Um, keep your head held up high because of it. You have a lot of honor because of it, and you made history. A section of the crypto bill aims to clarify treatment of digital assets. Why do they keep reiterating? Like every section, they reiterate the same thing over and over. It's a little bit strange. I don't. Is it filler? I'm not. Under, I don't understand why that happens. Do you have anything more fresh to say? That's what I'm. I'm, I'm looking for here. All right, listen, we're going to move on to the next the next article, because this one here, I don't know why it seems like it's repeating itself with each section. And that's just strange to me. So now let's move on here. We got a lot of good news today. Yeah, it's a good day today. All right. So now. We have this article in its title, Ripple CEO takes a jab, yeah, jab at Gensler after win in Congress. Hmm. Let's find out what what uh, what Gensler, what Mr. Garlinghouse has to, has to say. <laughs> Can you imagine Gensler as the uh, as the CEO of Ripple? It, it would have been over a long time ago. Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse recently reacted to the approval of the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act. Why do they have to say the whole thing every single time? Fit 21 by the House of Representatives by taking a jab at U.S. Securities Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler. Garlinghouse said that his take about Gensler becoming a political liability has aged well. In December 2023, Ripple CEO said that Gensler had, quote, destroyed, unquote, the integrity of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Well, judges have said that. There's judges that, that literally said, uh, well, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but you can look it up. It's easily found that they were saying pretty much that the SEC was abusing its power. That, that came from judges, not lawyers, not CEOs, not regular people, judges. So, I mean, hey, yeah. Uh, he definitely destroyed a lot that has to do with the SEC and uh, their respectability. It says here, the passage of the bill, which aims to create a legal framework for cryptocurrencies in the U.S., marked a major win for the cryptocurrency industry. The most striking thing about the recent vote was the fact that as many as and then they go into more politics and such like that. But this is what I don't this is why I don't get about these representatives. I'll just say this. They're supposed to represent the people, right? And, and people, no matter what their so-called political affiliation affiliation is, they need money, right? They need money. They want to build their families. They need house, houses. Um, and crypto provided all of that. I don't, I don't. I don't understand how that's political. Like that's just a universal thing that crypto was doing. So no matter who you're allegedly representing, you vote. To benefit all people. I, I mean, like, that's just, I don't know. That's how I look at it. Um, so anyway, I'm just, I'm different. I'm different. All right. So now let's move on here. What do we have here? So now also don't make sure um, you're checking the members only section. I will be releasing that video, the requested video, either tonight or tomorrow morning. I was supposed to release it, release it yesterday, but there were so many uploading problems. I didn't get to upload that video for yesterday until about like, 10 o'clock, 1030, something like that. I just didn't want to give up. It was a heck of an accomplishment, you know, uh, to get it put through, Because you know, so I felt good about that, that I didn't give up. It took a long time to get that uploaded. There was a lot of problems and still was I was able to get it out. So I felt good about that. Um, 
So anyway, because of that, I wasn't able to upload the members only video. And hopefully today there's no problems. I'm hoping. So anyway, this article here is titled one million dollar Bitcoin advocate Samson Mao reveals last chance to sell ETH. All right. Why would you want to sell ETH right now? I, I don't I don't think we've even hit overdrive yet. I think ETH could go higher. I do. But let's hear this uh, gentleman out because I, I liked a lot of what he's been saying as of late. So let's hear him out. It says vocal Bitcoiner Mao believes that this is the last time to exchange Ethereum for Bitcoin. Okay, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to get that money to shift over to Bitcoin. I don't understand this. Do people feel like Bitcoin needs help? I don't understand why you feel like there needs to be uh, this reallocation of capital from one thing to another. Bitcoin is mainstream. A lot of institutions are still yet to come into Bitcoin and they will. I don't think it needs help and I don't think you need to take down Ethereum or take capital from Ethereum in order for Bitcoin to thrive. I just don't see it that way. There's a lot of value in the world and many different uh, top cryptos, legit utility coin cryptos, I think will benefit. So Samson Mao, former Blockstream CSO and now the chief executive officer at Bitcoin adoption focus company January 3 or, or Jan 3. I don't know what that means, but I thought it meant January 3. Jan 3 is a radical Bitcoin maximalist. Is that how they phrase him? That's what they're calling him now. Is, has he always been that? All right. As the deadline for the SEC to reveal its decision on spot Ethereum ETFs is drawing closer, Mao began to slam Ethereum based ETFs. Why? I don't understand that. You just I don't know. It says, uh, I don't like that kind of energy. You, it's not necessary. It's not. It says, in a recent tweet, this $1 million Bitcoin advocate wrote that he is expecting them to be beaten by Bitcoin-based ones. This, this competitive mind state, when there is no competition, is something that a lot of humanity has bad. They will create chaos and calamity and problems where none exists. It could be completely peaceful. I've seen this a lot. It could be completely peaceful, right? And then one person will just start becoming envious of another or wanting to battle another. And it's like, why are you creating this drama and problem? It doesn't need to exist. Um, so I guess we're just cut from different different cloths. I'm a person. I like peace. I like prosperity. And if I rise, it has nothing to do at all with bringing someone else down. And that's coming. And I'm coming from a background where there's a lot of competition. <laughs> I was in a lot of sports, a lot of competition, but. I think you learn something from being in physical competitions. It just becomes like nothing, you know. Um, sure, it's something you participate in, but the winning and losing of it, and this is hard to this is hard to convey. The winning and losing of it, it becomes sort of like illusory. The veil is removed that this really, at the end of your life, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. You do it because you enjoy it. The winning and losing of it is completely illusory. The part that you enjoy is the journey. Like I enjoyed the hard working out. I enjoyed, you know, the camaraderie amongst the different people that I encountered and, you know, and, and building relationships with them. I enjoyed stepping on the mat. I enjoy grappling. I enjoy throwing punches and learning from that and adjusting like there's something to be gained there. It's hard to explain, but the whole winning and losing and this person has to go down and that's that that's like that you see the the illusory nature of a beginning and an ending. And really, I think what what a lot of us take from it is that the substance that's that that can be gained from is found in the journey. It's found in the work. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if people like this can understand that. Anyway, it says here, um, especially when you start begin becoming very good at something, you start seeing the same faces over and over. It doesn't matter where you're where you are. You all came up together. Whether it's whether it's wrestling, jujitsu, if you're competing at a high level, jujitsu, boxing. If you're doing it from a young age, right, and a lot of us have been doing these things from young ages, you start seeing the same faces at all the tournaments. So now you're going to, to clubs and like, not, you know, sports clubs is where everybody come together. You pay some money and they train you. You get trained by the best of the best. You're going to camps, right? You're seeing the same people all, all the time. So now you become familiar with them. So a lot of times you become friends with them. And uh, but but, you know. You get to the finals, semifinals, you're going to have to compete with each other. And, it's, and, and so it removes that personal nature 
from it. You get what I'm saying? Um, I don't know if, if individuals like this can understand that. It, it takes years to have that realization of it's the journey that matters. So anyway, it says, besides, he believes now is the last time for holders to sell Ethereum at a good price against Bitcoin. All right. That's his, that's his opinion. Everybody has their opinion to each his own. Right. I just humbly disagree. But I could be wrong because I, I'll say if the SEC does something funny with Ethereum, yes, it could bring the price down. But that's reasonable and logical. We know about that. We're aware. All right. So now I just don't think there needs to be competition between Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's enough money to go around. And I hold zero Ethereum. But I'm just saying. So now, oh, we got the banking news here. Here we go. So this article is titled, No Sign of Respect. Bank lays off 270 Cincinnati workers with no warning. Isn't that, I, I, I may be wrong. We have a lot of good lawyers here on the channel, so you let me know. Is that legal? Aren't you supposed to, I don't know, maybe it's different in various states. But aren't you supposed to let workers know before you lay them off, before you let them go, before you fire them? I, I thought that that's what it was, but maybe I'm wrong. It begins here. Roughly 270 people are losing their jobs working remotely in Cincinnati for an international bank's call center. One woman told WKRC there was no notice at all. Tammy Williams routine morning was completely changed by lunchtime on Tuesday. Her job of eight years. This is very grimy. Very, very wrong. Her job of eight years was gone without a warning. I hope she saved up a lot of money. See, this is why and this is why you got to save. You never know what's going to happen. I hope she saved up money for a, a rainy day. Um, maybe even had, you know, had it somewhere where it's growing her money is not letting it die in a savings account, you know. And she was prepared for this, I hope. Uh, anyway, it says, quote, there was no sign of respect, integrity, or even just caring about other people's, other people, or, or other people shown by, this is from Barclays? This was done by Barclays? Oh, these, these banks are in trouble. It says, unquote, said Williams. Williams says she started working for Barclays when it opened its call center in Hamilton back in 2016. It was one of the Hamilton's largest employers, but during the redacted, you know, <coughs> operations shifted to remote work with a co-working space and over the Rhine. I don't know what that is. I'm assuming it's some sort of program. She said her job was to be the person people would work with to resolve credit card issues. She said that a lack of communication from the company created a lot of confusion for workers on Tuesday. While Barclays notified the state of Ohio that layoffs would begin in July. She says she was officially terminated on Wednesday. Williams knew something was off when the phone stopped ringing. Wow, that's how they let you know. Typically, she would get hundreds of calls a day. So that was her first indication before automated emails started populating her inbox. Quote, my schedule had been totally wiped out, unquote, said Williams. Quote, I knew right then that we were closing. You don't see your entire schedule for a year totally say delete it delete it delete it if you're not being let go unquote wow and this is one of the reasons why uh how do i put this belief faith in the banking system uh is at an all-time low that's according to the experts okay we read multiple articles about that this is why deposit flight is huge this type of information here now this is being reported on abc6 now so this is not the huge uh station but I've noticed that the banks are able to keep information suppressed. But here's where the information is hard for them to keep it suppressed. These people, I, I firmly believe this. I've seen it a lot of times. These types of people will go on somewhere like TikTok and they will make their videos about what happened here and it will go viral. And so regular people will hear about this. And that's when regular people will lose even more respect for the legacy banking system. They're in trouble. You're in trouble. And this is one of the reasons why, like I said, they're going to need the new financial system. How does that tie in, Mick, in a lot of different ways? One, they'll be able to say, listen, here, uh, they can create new jobs. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, bring a little bit of faith back to the system to say, hey, listen, 
we're not who we used to be. Everything has been redone. Um, you can custody your own money and they're going to need more money as well because they're losing a ton of a ton of business. So now they can involve themselves with delegating, with staking, with lending, with, uh, you know, all that type of stuff there. The banks will need it because they're hemorrhaging capital very, very badly. Um, so, yeah, new financial system benefits them greatly, in my humble opinion. But let's move on here. All right. So now we have another. Is this a Bitcoin article here? So now we have another Bitcoin article. I believe that's what it is. It says it's titled Crypto Analyst says Bitcoin rally is far from over. I hope so. As it's yet to reach escape velocity. I, I firmly believe at some point, I don't know, in the next few months or so, Bitcoin will take off like a rocket. Um, everything's coiling up. Uh, you still haven't had all those other big companies step in just yet. So you have more catalysts like that coming to come. It says here, crypto analyst James Check. But this is just my humble opinion, not financial advice. James Check has predicted that Bitcoin could still make further moves to the upside. However, he warned about a, a quote, escape velocity, unquote, that could send the flagship crypto's price spiraling down. Spiraling down. OK. Simply put, escape velocity is the minimum speed at which a person or object needs to escape the Earth, Earth's gravitational pull. Why don't you just explain? We we know <laughs> we know what we know what escape velocity is. This <laughs> what do you think of us? Hold on a second. Wait a minute, sir. Wait a minute. <laughs> We're intelligent. We know <laughs> we know what that means. Why did you just explain that to us? Anyway, I, I'm going to give you a pass on that one. This suggests that the crypto token has yet to reach a point where it can be said that its price is unlikely to drop beyond a critical support level like seventy thousand dollars. The analyst remarked that Bitcoin not reaching escape velocity is a, quote, good thing, unquote. He further explained that this signals that the market is, quote, unlikely to be overstretched, overbought and oversaturated. Check uh, mentioned that a break above seventy three thousand dollars would turn short term holders into, quote, sufficient profit, unquote, leading to some resistance to Bitcoin's price. Basically, the analyst suggested that Bitcoin reaching that price level could lead to a wave of sell offs from the short term holders. Yeah, that's definitely possible, which could cause Bitcoin's price to stagger or even decline. OK, I see where you're going with that. Now, that makes sense. OK, however, things could also turn out well. Yeah, but I'm not, too, too, you know, personally, I'm not worried about the short term people because I think the big companies are looking at something much more long term, much bigger, and they want massive profits and they know it's possible. Once again, they haven't given the green light to mainstream media to tell everybody, hey, go get Bitcoin. They can anytime they want. They own mainstream media. And yet it's been. It hasn't been they haven't been pushing Bitcoin majorly like they could. They haven't been. Um, but when it's time. Just keep that in mind. If you start seeing mainstream media talking about Bitcoin positively all over the place more than they usually do, just know that's the time where they gave the green light and then that price can possibly skyrocket. Possibly. It's no guarantees, of course. Um, but a lot of regular people, they believe in and they follow mainstream media. And if the mainstream media does not tell them something, they don't believe it. That's just the way that it is. All right. So now. Maybe we'll skip the Coinbase article here. They're doing some good things. We have a Hedera article and we have a gold article. OK, so let's let's get to the Hedera information. We want to cover H bars, one of our original OG OG utility coins, bank coins. They've been doing a great job. So this article is titled The Evolution of Hedera Services. H bar, H bar, Hedera. They've been doing a great job. The release of services software version V0.49 in May 2024 introduces a significant engineering update to the core code run by Hedera consensus nodes. This substantially refactored version has been, quote, modularized, unquote, developed and delivered through extensive work for over the past 12 months. This article expands on details and benefits of this modularization. OK, let's find out what that is. It says the key driver behind modularization was to simplify the Hedera code base, making it more accessible for collaboration, particularly from external developers. This restructuring in introduced 
new abstractions that clearly separate various concerns within the code, thereby enhancing its manageability and scalability. The more streamlined architecture not only facilitates easier contributions from a growing number of de developers, but also speeds up the development of new services. And after all these big partnerships they just brought in recently, that's definitely going to be beneficial in my humble opinion. This is more flexibility and stability. One of the standout features of the modular code is its flexibility in service creation and behavior modification. This architecture opens the door for future developments like synchronous mode operation, offering developers the potential to use tools like hard hat to operate a quote test unquote Hedera node, closely mirroring operational dynamics and platforms like Ethereum. This capability significantly lowers the entry barrier for developers familiar with other blockchain environments who are looking to experiment with or migrate to Hedera. Very, very good. And we're going to end off with a little bit of gold. Sweet, sweet gold. Gold is too sweet. Did I make, a, <laughs> did I make Scott Hall proud? <laughs> All my wrestling people out there, like WWE style wrestling, not like what we did, freestyle and all that, you know. But, you know, some people out there, you may be familiar with Razor Ramon, Scott Hall. And when he was a part of that group with um, with um, Hulk Hogan and um, Kevin Nash, they were a part of that group called the NWO. And they would say, too sweet. Yeah. Anyway, gold is too sweet. Like, oh, come on, Alfred, get back to the news. <laughs> I got you. Hold on. All right. This article was titled, Why RBI is Stocking Up Aggressively on Gold Reserves. I told you, this is not going to stop. There's something going on with fiat currencies. The banks don't trust it anymore. They don't trust the people. They don't trust the governments. So they all been collecting massive record, record amounts of gold. And this is why I'm so glad a lot of us got lots of gold when it was low. All right, because where gold can go in the future, I think is is, is going to be mind blowing. It already went, went way past my prediction, way past it. Um, so who knows how high it can go now? But anyway, it says central bank buys 1.5 times more gold in Jan January to April than entire 2023. That's eye opening. RBI stocks up on gold reserves from January to April 2024. The Reserve Bank of India added 24 tons of gold to its reserves, a strategic move to hedge against volatility amidst geopolitical tensions. I don't think that's why they're doing it, but sure. I mean, if you want to use that as a guise uh, as to why you're doing it, so be it. This addition is significantly higher than the 16 tons added throughout 2023 as per the analysis of rbi data this is according to an et report as of april 26 2024 the rbi held 827 tons of gold as part of its foreign exchange reserves an increase from 803 tons at the end of december and you know what else is very interesting uh and i like seeing that a lot of the regular people uh are starting to you know uh, get involved with gold you know whether it's through um what's that store that's selling gold is it costco i think it may be costco and then now is it true i'm not sure folks i'm just i, I read something is it true that walmart is trying to sell gold and silver is that is that accurate i gotta look it up um but if so it gives more opportunity for people to acquire physical physical gold right um so that's very interesting and and and, and i so I think that's very good for a lot of a lot of um, the people to get involved and have sort of a balance to their their portfolios, diversify a little bit of their holdings. Um, too many people, I think, are in one thing and it's never good to keep all your eggs in one basket. You know what I mean? So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with this. So until next time, everybody, let's get to ooh, what was that? Oh, man, I messed up my answer. Let's get to the money. 